Hello, Yanis. Hi, Frank. It's good to see you again. Same. Good. Good to see you again, even if uh, only virtually. Um, I wanted to talk to you today because there's so much happening. Uh, it's it's actually hard to keep track, but we are now very close to um, a year of the start of the Gaza genocide. Mm -hmm. It's October second today, and maybe naively. Many of many of us, including myself, thought we would never be talking about the Gaza genocide a year a year on, and that we might be talking about a ceasefire instead of talking about a ceasefire in Gaza. Israel has kind of gone crazy, mad, and has started bombing Gaza, Lebanon, Yemen, Syria. And when I talk about bombing, I talk about using 2,000 pounds dumb bombs, as they call them, on civilian areas. Um, many of us, I've got to say, talking to my friends, uh, I feel I felt defeated in the last few days, deflated. Um, I was wondering, and it's a quite a broad question, but what's your analysis, if there is an analysis of, of the situation? right now? Well, besides the depression, at the sight of so many people dying, of so many other people being consumed by a genocidal mania, uh, mostly good people. You know, most people are not neither very good nor very bad. Uh, this is what Hannah Arendt taught us. And yet you see people who are not necessarily evil being totally hijacked by the, the genocidal mindset. Um, you know, there is such, such such a thing as we speak now, genocide tourism. I saw, did you see that cruise ship that um, left uh, Tel Aviv uh, with uh, holiday makers, with uh, spectators, uh, the purpose of whom was to sail by Gaza to, to see up close and personally the destruction to cheer the bombs falling on the people of Gaza. Uh, you know, the, the, but before we allow ourselves to be consumed by pessimism and sadness, <clears throat> it's important not to lose sight of what's going on. And, you know, we must always, always seek the truth about what's going on from the horse's mouth. So, you know that Netanyahu went to Washington recently, uh, effectively to... Uh, outline his um, war escalation policy and to get the okay from the Biden administration, which clearly he did. But before he got into the aeroplane to fly from Tel Aviv to uh, the United States, the Knesset passed the resolution, a declaration. It said, and I'll just quote one paragraph, it said, the Knesset of Israel this is verbatim, the Knesset of Israel, firmly opposes the establishment of a Palestinian state west of Jordan, that is from the river to the sea, no Palestinian state. The establishment of a Palestinian state in the heart of the land of Israel will pose an existential danger to the state of Israel and its citizens, perpetuate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, <laughs> of course, <laughs> and destabilize the region. Now, Recently, only a month ago, the International Court of Justice decreed that Israel's occupation of the Palestinian lands west of the Jordan River um, was plainly, this is the language of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, it, was, it is plainly illegal. The United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to back the International Court of Justice and call for Israel to withdraw from Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. So let's not forget that this is what it's all about. Here we have Israel uh, determined, and this is not ne just Netanyahu. Let's not focus on Netanyahu, because when you've got a vote in the Knesset, which is what, um, if, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, some like 69 to 8, in favor of this essential declaration that from the river 
to the sea, there will be no Palestinians, and this is how there will be no Palestinian conflict. Of course, if you get rid of the Palestinians, there will be no conflict between Israel, Israel, Israel and the Palestinians. That is what the whole thing is. And, you know, allow me just to, one, to say one more thing before shutting up. Um, to, to understand the whole thing, we need to combine this recent decision by the Knesset with something that David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, said. At the graveside of Israelis, who in the 1950s, I don't remember which year exactly it was, uh, very close to the border, to the border, to the fence with Gaza, were gunned down by Palestinians who had crossed the fence and walked into a village and killed some Israelis. Ben-Gurion went to that funeral and he gave a eulogy for the fallen Israelis, which is fascinating. Because he begins, like you and I would have begun, by saying, don't be angry with the Palestinians who crossed the border and killed our own. We would have done the same thing if we were them. We threw them off their land and we put them in there. We deny them hope. We deny them any possibility in the future of returning to their homes. So this is something we have to accept. So far, so good, right? And then, in this infamous speech by Ben Gurion, he continues to say, so, he said, not the humanist road, which is to find a way of reconciling with these people. No, we have to keep expanding. And we have to be armed. And we have to kill them before they kill us. Because they have a righteous anger against us. And if we are going to keep Israel a majority Jewish state only for the Jews and with the right to return for people who have never been in their area for a thousand years, whereas these people whom we got rid of and put, put them behind the Gaza fence have no right to even come and visit their homes, now of course they're going to kill us, so we have to kill them first. Now, put together, Ben Gurion's ancient now, you know, 1950s speech at the gravesite of people who were kill, killed by Gazan Palestinians and the recent Knesset uh, um, decision that from the river to the sea there will be no Palestinian state. Essentially, if there are Palestinians who stay, they will be as slaves, you know, wage slaves, uh, with no rights in an apartheid state. Well, you have the answer to what, what, everything that's happening. Everything else is simply stupid details. Thanks for that. Context is, is crucial, but it's what's lacking immensely from the mainstream media and from sort of our so-called leaders. I mean, you've been, you worked, you were involved like in the highest sphere of power, you know, during your tenure as finance minister of Greece. And I remember uh, reading your book, Adults in the Room, and being fascinated by the lack of democracy of the European Union and other instances. When you hear Biden saying, and his you know, State Department saying day after day, we do, no, we do not want things to escalate in the region. The next day, Israel does the beeper, you know, the beeper thing where like, it kills Hezbollah members. Then Biden says, do not escalate. The day after, it's the walkie talkies. Then Biden says, do not escalate and then they bomb and kill Nasrallah in in the most horrifying manner killing hundreds of civilians in the so what does it mean in practice when a, a power would say do not escalate but actually do not take any action to avoid ex escalation and quite the opposite sends more and more weapons and how are we supposed us the people to react to that to that well, look, it, my grandmother taught me from a very young age that uh, you must judge people not by what they say, but by what they do. So if you keep arming the aggressor uh, without any conditions attached, zero conditions attached, uh, and then you simply give a pep talk, what is the pep talk all about? It's not because Biden ever imagined that Bibi Netanyahu would follow the heed the advice of President Biden, 
Biden is not a stupid man. He may be very old and quasi senile, but he's smart enough to know that there's no way on earth. I mean, Netanyahu never hid that. You know, his intention was always to annihilate any chance of a Palestinian state anywhere near Israel, or anywhere in the world for that matter. He would love, love the Palestinians to be absorbed by other Arab countries and simply become Jordanian, Saudi, whatever. Huh? Because the very existence of the notion of a Palestinian nation is a threat to the supremacy of um, a Jewish state that um, doesn't have to answer about Palestinians to anyone because they, they have been either eliminated or tempted to Jordanians, Moroccans or Egyptians. Uh, so, Netanyahu has always been clear. But so has Biden in the final analysis. Biden, all his career, all his career, for decades now, he declares to be a Zionist. And he's got every right to do that. But we have every obligation to understand what that means. It doesn't mean being pro-Jewish. It doesn't mean caring about Jewish life, it doesn't mean sympathizing with a nation, the Jews, who have been persecuted in Europe for centuries. I am all that. <laughs> uh, being a Zionist means to accept, to accept, to embrace the white settlers' dictum, a land without a people for a people without a land. That's what Zionism is, that we're going to come as Jews, as Zionists, to the land of Palestine, uh, which is a land without a people. Now, they are not the first people to do this. The British, when they went to Australia, upon arriving, they, they found five million Aborigines there, right? But immediately, for legal purposes, they declared it terra nullius, a land without a people. That's the beginning of genocide. And then they proceeded to eliminate them, of, of, to the Aborigines. And since they were not people, it wasn't murder. It wasn't genocide. It was like eliminating kangaroos, right? So the moment you, you, you shift to a Zionist mindset that the land of Palestine, west of the Jordan River, river is a land without a people, well, the next step is to ensure that it's a land without a people by eliminating them. So when Biden says he's a Zionist, essentially he says that he adopts the agenda of Netanyahu and of the Israeli state of apartheid, at best, at best, apartheid, and at worst, elimination, genocide. At best, apartheid, at worst, genocide. That's what, you know, he says. The tragedy of the United States is that it's not a democracy, that it's an oligarchy with one party system that has two variants uh, who oscillate in power, like Twiddledum and Twiddledee. Uh, so, if whether Trump is elected or Harris is elected, it makes no difference whatsoever. Because th th this deep state, this one party state, let's call it one party state, because it is a one party state. Hmm? This one party state um, is totally invested in the Zionist project because it is considered, consistent with a number of interests that the economic forces hiding behind the one-party state in Washington, D.C. Uh, have. One interest, of course, is uh, to use Israel as uh, a huge American base in the Middle East to keep everybody in awe to keep the Arabs divided, uh, to keep their governments at odds with their own people, uh, to ensure initially it was oil, now it is trade routes. Uh, that's, that's one reason. Secondly, because the United States macroeconomy, I'm speaking here as an economist, is absolutely dependent on its uh, defense budget. The American defense budget is its investment program. It is its macroeconomic stimulus program. When in 1991 the Soviet Union collapsed, because there are conflicts within Congress, the pharmaceutical companies do not want all the money to go to the to, to the Lockheeds, yeah, to the armaments industry. They would like some money from themselves. 
So it was difficult to justify after the end of the Soviet Union maintaining the military budget where it was at the height of the Cold War. So it, it came down. Immediately there was a massive economic crisis in 1991 for every, anyone who's old enough to remember. And what happened? Well, America invaded Iraq. Saddam Hussein was their man. He was their bastard, to use an expression by Roosevelt. We used to call, he, he called an American, a Latin American dictator, a bastard, but he said, but he's our bastard. Well, you know, Saddam Hussein was their bastard. They essentially told him to unleash a very lethal war against Iran when Iran was moved out of the sphere of influence of the United States with Ayatollah Khomeini. When, you know, two million people died in that war at the behest of the United States. And Saddam Hussein was their agent. So, and they made him, they, they indebted him to Kuwait because Kuwait was paying for, for the war. And then Kuwait, after the end of that war, demanded his money back. And the United States, when they needed the war, in order to replenish their armaments, in order to boost their macroeconomic stimulus, <laughs> after the end of the, 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 you know, the Cold War, Essentially, they whispered into Saddam Hussein's ear through the American ambassador in Kuwait. If you take Kuwait, we, we won't mind. This was a, a way of inciting him to come in so that they would then attack him. And, you know, even after Hussein's army had lost the war to the invading Americans, it is well known now that the American Air Force had orders to empty all their cruise missiles, all their missiles, into the desert just to get rid of it so that they would buy new inventory. So that's another reason why Israel and the constant wars in the Middle East are essential to the United States. Now they have Ukraine as well. But, you know, so these wars are essential for the macroeconomic uh, situation, equilibrium. Uh, th there are many reasons why the United States is completely wedded with Zionism. So, in the end, uh, Robert Fisk, whom I'm sure you remember the wonderful British journalist who spent most of his life in Lebanon and in the surrounding areas unveiling the West's uh, uh, lethal role in the Middle East. He once commented that uh, Palestinian liberation is important because not only will the Palestinians be freed if their struggle succeeds, but it's the only way that the Americans can become free. Palestinian liberty is, he said, a prerequisite for the freeing up of the Americans from a regime which uses the Middle East partly in the way they use the Ukraine, the new Cold War against China, in order to keep their own people under wraps. Yeah, so what you're saying is that both the US and I guess Israel need the state of permanent war, right? They need to find a new enemy every time there's one who disappears. And that's it's very clear and you've explained it very well. Uh, so yesterday, Iran responded to months and months of provocation by Israel. Uh, we are facing, if you watch the mainstream media, an inversion of reality. Uh, mm -hmm. saying that it's Iran provoking Israel, where you have to remember that when we talk about provocation, it's not minor. They killed Ismail Haniyeh in Iran. They killed a very high-ranking Iranian official while killing Nasrallah as well. Uh, they've been provoking Iran for years. We know Netanyahu wants to go to war with Iran. My opinion is that it's very important for Israel as the sole nuclear power in the Middle East to remain the sole nuclear power in the Middle East because it's a deterrent. But once Iran gets the nuclear bomb, bomb uh, then it's another, it's another matter. But how do we, um, how do we fight as this inversion of reality? You know, I can't bear watching the mainstream media anymore. Because it's so obvious, you know, you've got Israel bombing everyone around, running amok, g going crazy. And then you've got the Macron, the mainstream media telling you Israel is the victim uh, and everyone wants Israel annihilation. Yesterday or no, two days ago, the Jordanian prime minister said in front of the whole media, here I am representing 57 Arab states. We tell Israel we want peace. Get out of the occupied territories you will have peace. We've been saying this for years. The Arab peace plan has been proposed to Israel year after year after year. 
So how do we respond to this? Um, really, this is like George Orwell, you know, this inversion of reality. Frank, the answer, my answer, there may be better answers, but my answer is that we must always use Israeli and Jewish sources. Always. I did this earlier by mentioning the Ben-Gurion speech. I think, you know, every Israeli I know um, thinks very highly of Ben-Gurion, even if they disagree with him politically. He was a Labour Party leader. But nevertheless, he's, you know, one of the giants of modern Israeli history. So just quote him. Don't quote me, because nobody wants in Israel to listen to me or to you. Um, but Ben Gurion just plastered it in the front of the This this is what your you know inaugural prime minister said. Uh, then you can if you want more radical voices, let's do it. Think of Albert Einstein's letter. Uh, which he published in a newspaper in, in in the United States, in which he says that he is v seriously worried about fascist Israeli politicians um, who will create exactly what they are creating now. So let the proponents of genocide and the apologists of gen genocide and the enablers of genocide counter Ben Gurion and Albert Einstein. I think th this is what what I believe the answer to your question is. But as far as, you know, what the Jordanian Prime Minister says, allow me to be less than impressed. Because Jordan has continuously, consistently played the game of Washington in the area. It has uh, paid lip service to the rights of Palestinians. There's no doubt that they're annoyed with Israel. But they are not prepared to lift their little finger to do anything that seriously opposes apartheid and genocide in, uh, you know, the area west of the Jordan River. Uh, these regimes have been co-opted by the United States. Think of Egypt. You know, the brutality of the Egyptian regime as, as we speak, there are hundreds of thousands of political prisoners under this dictator Sisi, the General Lissimo, you know, the Franco of, uh, of Egypt, as I call him. And, you know, this is, this is a major, major demerit, disadvantage of the Palestinian people. Because supporters of Israel delight in pointing out the corruption of the Arab regimes and how the Arab regimes don't care about the Palestinians. So it's not just that, you know, it, I, I would... Go, I would um, uh, take exception to this narrative that is 50-something Arab states versus Israel. Not exactly. The United Arab Emirates and Morocco and Egypt and so on, you know, uh, were ready to, I mean, some of them, not some of them, under the Abraham, Abraham Accords, they made peace with Israel while Israel is ethnically cleansing the Palestinians. Um, Sadat began that in the 1970s when he made peace with Israel uh, without any conditions about the Palestinians. So the Palestinians are being constantly betrayed by their own cousins in the Arab world. They know that. They understand that. And this is why Iran has become prominent. Because being a non-Arab Islamic state, which, by the way, you know, I, I think that there is a, a schizoid situation now. And one that makes it very hard for me to comment on what is going on in Iran and in the broader um, Middle Eastern area. Uh, let, let me be specific what I mean by this. Now, I feel immense solidarity for the women of Iran who live under gender apartheid. I, my comrades in Iran are against the regime. I am in support of my comrades who are against the regime. At the very same time, this regime is the only one that supports the Palestinians against the genocide, in the context of the genocide. And they've been very, very measured. You're right. They have taken their time to retaliate when Israel has uh, monstrously bombed and killed their leaders, the leaders of uh, Hezbollah and so on. They remember some a couple of months ago, when was it they... Uh, they even announced when they would attack Israel so that Israel, Britain, France, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, 
and the United States, of course, would shoot down their missiles because they wanted to make it, it was a demonstration effect that we cannot not act, but at the same time, we don't want to escalate. So you've got this extremely measured behavior by the Iranian regime outside the country and uh, gender apartheid and authoritarianism and Islamism, Islamist fundamentalism uh, within the country. So that is another impediment. You know, it used to be the case that us left-wingers, <laughs> Um, you know, we, 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 we luxuriated in the idea by, let's say, in, you know, 1936, 1937, that, it, you know, they, they were the good guys and the bad guys. We, the socialists and the Soviet Union, uh, the, the Union of the Socialist Soviet Republics versus the Nazis versus the fascists and so on. Well, that is all gone now. Now there is a variety of... Uh, regimes and forces that betray the Palestinians. And the Palestinians are the, on the receiving end of American imperialism, Israeli racism, um, Arab regime authoritarianism and betrayal of the Palestinians. Uh, and you end up with Iran being the only consistent supporter of the Palestinians, while at the same time um, behaving in a way which I cannot possibly um, accept in the domestically in the interior of Iran. The hope that we need to exude, because we are running a very serious risk during this conversation, or I'm running a risk during my monologues, uh, of uh, depressing everybody. I think the, in the end, it is what's happening in Israel that will determine whether the Palestinians have a chance. It is true that the peace movement and the progressives in Israel are decimated. They themselves fear for their lives. I'm in constant contact with people in Israel, Israeli Jews, who fear for their lives because they advocate an end to the genocide. They can't even say the word genocide without being threatened, losing jobs, being beaten up, being arrested, and so on. But, you know, Frank, I am an eternal romantic. I believe that uh, the young men and women who are part of the genocide and who are now, you know, in the heat of the battle, driven by adrenaline, when they go back to Israel at some point, even on the leave, they will have sleepless nights. The memory of the, the bodies of the, the babies that they have killed or who were killed in front of them, is going to haunt them in the same way that the Vietnam War soldiers, when they came back from Vietnam in the United States, uh, they lived and relived and relived what they had done. They changed their mind. People like Oliver Stone, who fought in Vietnam and then came back and became an anti-war uh, activist. This is, I think, the greatest source of hope. The resilience of the Palestinian people, international solidarity, and changes within Israeli society. Because let's face it, Israel is being destroyed by the people who are ruling it. Uh, at the moment, uh, you know, what was good about Israel? This is a rhetorical question. They, they were progressive intellectuals, um, writers, authors, poets, musicians of, um, you know, a broadly humanistic Jewish, European, but also African tradition, and the you know the rich Jewish culture. Now, that was one thing. Then there are the settlers, the settlers in the West Bank, uh, who are now overrepresented in the government with people like Smotrich, huh? um, those genocidal maniacs. Now they are taking over the government, and they are a clear and present danger for humanist, progressive cultured Israelis in Tel Aviv, in uh, Haifa. So the clash between those, the human proclivity for having nightmares when you have participated in a genocide, and we've seen this in Germany, we've seen this in the United States, we've seen it in Rwanda, we've seen it in former Yugoslavia. That's what I am putting all my hopes on. 
Thanks, Yanis. Um, I, I was actually going to ask you a question about hope, but you, you've partly responded. Um, we, we also seeing the Israeli economy suffer immensely from like a year of genocide. I mean, Israel credit score has been downgraded. Its gross domestic product is like shrinking sharply. Tens of thousands of businesses have closed. Um, a growing number of jobs have moved ashore. And there's also um, Israel reputation on the sort of, you know, on the global scale that has been, I mean, it was already quite bad, but it's been completely shattered. Um, and also, I remember, I just read a few days ago, the Progressive International, an organization that you've helped funded, um, which said that, you know, I'm going to read, I'm going to quote a paragraph, the Israeli regime's shocking violence recalls the dying gasps of apartheid South Africa, which escalated its war against Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, as it crumbled. Uh, so that's also my hope. That, yeah. And that's the hope of, I was talking to Ilan Pape a few weeks ago, and he said, I'm very pessimistic for the short term, but optimistic for the long term. Then I was in a cab with a, 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 a man from Gaza, and he said the same thing. So um, I think we're going to face a very brutal, I mean, we are. Palestinians are, Lebanese people are, a brutal few years, but hopefully um, we are seeing the last gaps of apartheid Israel. And I'm, I'm not saying the Israeli people, I'm saying apartheid Israel. So the regime in place you that need. facilitates, you know, yeah. But just like in South Africa, the liberation of the Palestinians is a prerequisite for the liberation of the Israelis. The Israelis live in fear and will always live in fear as long as they are part of a regime and supportive of a regime or enablers of a regime that carries out genocide. And, you know, look, look, the, the worst fear of a bully is that of, you know, of another bully bullying them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, violence breeds fear in the strong party that exercises that violence. But see, to conclude the, the this... Um, analogy with South Africa, however, we have a duty to do that which we did during the anti-apartheid uh, movement and period uh, leading to the liberation, to the freeing up of Nelson Mandela and the end of apartheid. Boycott, divest and sanction. The BDS movement has the right recipe for speeding up the process that you are describing. In the same way that boycotting, divesting, and sanctioning South Africa was essential, it would not, you know the, system, the regime would not have crumbled without that. It was only when Barclays and uh, Ford Motor Company and Fiat decided to, you know, they couldn't take any more the um, criticism and the loss of face in the eyes of the general public in the West. When they left South Africa, together with the sanctions, you know, they couldn't travel. The leaders of the South African regime couldn't travel, couldn't send their money abroad, couldn't, um, you know, let, you, use the, the wealth that they were extracting from the black population to their heart's content. It was only then that their resolve waned. We need to do the same thing. Unfortunately, some people, and some people in the center as well, not just on the extreme right, in Germany, in the United States, in Britain, they consider they try to present BDS, the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, as racist and anti-Semitic. Folks, get a hold of your senses. The whole point about BDS is non-violence. Here you have apartheid. You have the Knesset deciding that there will be no Palestinian state west of the Jordan against the Western the Western position that there should be a second state west of the Jordan. Right? And what does the BDS say? We are not going to do it through, the, through guns and bombs, but we're going to do it through peaceful means, like boycotting, divesting, sanctioning, and you call those, these people out as anti-Semites? What are they supposed to do? Commit suicide in order to, to do what? In, in the end, the Western forces and governments and powers are also humiliated because they keep insisting on a two-state solution that Israel has and the Knesset has decided will never happen. So make up your minds. Do you want violence, war, or do you want BDS? There is no third option. 
Thank you, Yanis. As always, super interesting. Thank, Thank you. you.